Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here, and welcome back to Board Game Blender. Today we're going to be talking about epic gaming moments. Uh, those, uh, you know, memorable stories that come out of the tabletop gatherings that we like to have. And a lot of people love that about gaming. Now, yeah, sure, you can play games that aren't necessarily memorable because of the storyline, because of the events that transpired in whatever setting you are in, but they are all designed to transport you in many ways, to take you to a different headspace. And I think one of the most relatable ways that games do that is by immersing you in a world that is not your own and allowing you to tell epic tales, to, to have moments that are so grandiose in which you did something so amazing that you will remember that moment. I find that very captivating myself. So, hopefully you discover uh, at least one new game in here that perhaps will allow you to tell your own epic moments within that game. And I definitely want to hear from you what you consider to be some of your more epic gaming moments at the table. So let me know in the comments below. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the episode. Howdy folks, welcome to Two Player Showdown. I'm Rebecca, this is Hunter, and today we're going to talk about epic games of epicness. Starting with War of the Ring. War of the Ring by far has our most epic endings and epic moments. Unfortunately, we've already featured War of the Ring on a previous episode of Board Game Blender. Boo. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them, in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. All right, fine. How about Arcadia Quest? Wow, wow, wow. Arcadia Quest has by far our most epic ending of all time. But, we've featured that game as well on Board Game Blender. That's enough to kill him if I have to get after whiff on all the crits. You better whiff. Here it goes. <laughs> Victory is mine! <laughs> Well, fine then. Can we at least talk about TI4? Now there you go, TI4. So let me tell you about an epic moment in TI4. So there I was, innocently flying about space, when I proposed an amazing deal. I offered Rebecca trade goods all sorts of great things. An exchange of planets, all sorts of just, I just threw the kitchen sink at her. All I wanted to do for one round to take over a single planet. And she said happily, that sounds like a great deal, let's do it. So I took over that planet and then she proceeded to annihilate me. <laughs> That's right, and I'll do it again. <laughs> so I had a quest that I wanted to complete that required a planet. Quest, schmest. Epic betrayal. It was pretty epic. I've never betrayed him before in a game, and then I chose to do it then. It worked out quite well. Never trust her again. See? Epic. Epic, epic. It's moments like these that you live for. Of course, if you're going to commit yourself to like an eight hour game, you better have some good memories with it. And every single time we've played, we've had moments like that. I don't know if I would call them good memories. Oh, it was good memories. <laughs> it was good memories. Your memories, all right. Yeah, so Burned if you want to keep. Into my heart. <laughs> oh my goodness, drama. If you want high action, drama, intrigue, space, all of the above. You need to try out Twilight Imperium. Thank you so much for joining us. Cool catch for trail! <laughs> Hi, 
Hi everyone, my name is Chris and this is the Teacher's Lounge. And if you're like me, you realize you're getting old when you have thoughts like, Cheerios taste like cardboard, but you know, like the good kind. But also if you're like me, you love teaching games to your friends and to your family, so the Teacher's Lounge is where I'm gonna share teaching recommendations that I've picked up from myself and from other people over the years. Today's game is an epic. It is story driven and it has a wonderful theme and art and storyline to it and it grabs people into the hobby and it's not complicated and it comes in a small box and the game is Forbidden Island. I love Forbidden Island. This is a game of adventurers moving around an island, each with special powers, all moving around trying to collect cards that match these these treasures, and when you have collected a set of them, you can trade them in to rescue this treasure, pull it off of a sinking island. Sinking island, you say? Of course. After every player's turn, you reveal cards, and you find the matching landscape tile that goes with it. And when that tile flips over, it is now flooded. As you shuffle this deck, and if this card comes out again, that tile now sinks into the abyss, never to be found again. Now, there are more tiles that the island is made up of. It is a much larger island than this, but if ever both of the treasure pieces for a treasure that you have not rescued yet sinks, you lose. If an adventurer is ever on an island and he cannot move to the adjacent one before it flips over and sinks into the abyss, if any player dies, you lose. And most dreaded of all, if your helicopter pad floods and if it then gets drawn again and is sunken off the island, you will never escape. This is a great theme. It has great artwork. It has great quality components. All of this for a very reasonable price point. For that reason, this is many people's first cooperative game in the hobby. It was ours, and I absolutely love it for that. And so, I definitely think that this is always going to stay in my game collection because for such a simple rule set, for such a simple objective, rescue four treasures, get off the island, it is engaging, it's engrossing, we've created stories off of this, we name our characters different things, oh this guy's Diver Mc, uh, 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 Shovels McDiggerton, you know, one of my favorite characters to play. I love so much about this, and even though it's not the biggest and it's not the most sprawling game ever, it does create stories, tension, and drama, and I love that. So my teaching recommendation, especially since this is such an effective first cooperative game for so many people in the hobby, is when you teach it, make sure to painstakingly overly emphasize and make crystal clear what a cooperative game is. So many people have never experienced that. I love using this game when people say, hey, what kind of games do you like to play, Chris? Like Monopoly? I say, well, there's some great modern designs. One I especially love, your adventurers working together instead of against each other. You're working as a team to rescue treasures off of a sinking island. People say, whoa, that sounds great. Yes, it is great. And so this is one of the ones that I use. And so when I teach it, I painstakingly make sure that, especially for newcomers to the hobby, this is what a cooperative game is. We're going to be working together and we're going to be sharing cards and we're going to be planning together so that we can effectively win as a team. Because I have taught cooperative games where I thought I made it clear and it wasn't clear and at the end of the rules explanation, someone looked at me and said, so how do I win? I failed that person because for the whole rules explanation, they're not sitting there putting two and two together of when I have treasure cards, I can share them with other players at the table or we need to plan together how to, uh, it, you know, if, if an important tile is sunk, uh, is, is flooded, how do we prevent it from sinking? How do we move over there and flip it back over? They're missing out on all the cooperative elements of the rules explanation. So I make sure to make it painstakingly clear what a cooperative game means, not just by saying that, but hey, this is a team effort, we're all gonna win or lose together, and I find that that makes it much more effective. So, I hope that you appreciate that teaching recommendation. If you have any that you'd like to share, comment below, I'll be responding under the name Meeple Overboard, which is the podcast that my wife and I do together. You can go check that out, but most importantly, enjoy the rest of your blender. Now I know what you're gonna say, hey, come on Z, the others from Simon is not under the radar. 
And, you know, you're partly right, but when you put this game up against other games of its ilk, I would say it certainly gets less love, less appreciation that I than, than what I think it's due. Because I do consider the others to be a fantastic, miniatures-driven, but also mechanically very sound game. This is a game that easily tells epic gaming moments, and the reason it does that is, well, there's a few reasons for it. Uh, I think it's epic in many moments because it allows the players to decide how m much risk versus reward they are going to commit to. In the game, all of the good players playing against the evil player, the sin player, they are allowed to take corruption in order to do more for that turn, be it a, a battle, a uh, search, uh, if they are trying to uh, put out a fire or fight, uh, you know, a, some something that, that has sprouted up in the city, whatever it may be. And so you're allowed to hurt yourself to do better. That moment in which you decide, I'm going to do something for the greater good, I am going to take the, that corruption so that I can, you know, attempt to put this baddie down for good, is, that's an interesting thing. It's an epic thing that you choose to do the baddies are going to continue popping up. You know, the player who is playing the Sin has tons of opportunities to do, uh, you know, epic moves, epic moments, to traverse their creatures across the city to attack you after you take a turn, and also deploy an acolyte in there, and also possibly play a card to affect that combat. All these things compound to have that role become epic. And... The ramp-up effect in this game is incredible. At the beginning, you're going to be doing a few things. You'll be, you know, rolling a few dice, uh, having some encounters, but you're not quite going to have these epic matchups. But at some point in the campaign, in that setting, you are going to have the baddie show up. Now, this is just one of them for the various sins. You have another one right in the box. You have several others that you can get from expansions. This guy cannot even come onto the board at the beginning of the game, but he will show up at some point, as denoted by the storyline, just pop up on the board, and he is a beast to take down. So that's epic. And then the number of dice, the powers, that the players are gathering as the game goes on, just continues to ramp up and up. It's like a good movie. You know, that first act is setting everything up, you have that rising tension, but once you hit that second act... And then you get to the end of the movie, right? The end of this epic story. Boy, you are going to have some crazy roll-offs. You are going to have some amazing power-ups that you've gathered in the city. The baddies are going to have this crazy thing out. They're going to be rolling tons of dice. They are going to be, uh, you know, if they're careful, gathering more powerful cards to play against you, all of that. But again, all of this is balanced on a knife's edge. I like that for just about everything in the game, you have to give something up in order to get something that hopefully you'll be able to leverage to your advantage. That goes both for the good guys and the baddie. And I find that very interesting. You know, I find it to be the most epic kind of moment in a game is not just the game going here, you are now stronger or you are now better at something, but here is the option to be better or stronger if you're willing to sacrifice a little bit. That's very, uh, I don't know, cinematic to me, so I like it a lot. So there you go. The Others, I think, is a fantastic miniatures, dice-driven game with tons going on, and I would say it is kind of underappreciated when it comes to, you know, these kinds of games, big, epic Tons of minis, dudes on a map fighting sort of games. Um, it's not the biggest scope of them all, but you combine the theme, the mechanisms, the tension, the, you know, terror, and not because the game's going to scare you, but because the situations are so terrifying. That tension of giving up too much, it does, you know, make you, uh, sort of puts the players on edge. That's the idea. That's where the terror in the game comes from. I think this is one that deserves a lot more love than it gets. So, there you go for Under the Radar, The Others. Yes, I know I talk about it a lot, but you know what? I love it. It's fantastic. Check it out. I'll see you next time.
previously on the Board Game Blender. Dear Mr Garfield, I'd like to congratulate you on your ongoing success in the gaming industry. Many people would have retired after creating such a massive success as Magic the Gathering. However, you've gone on to design further hits such as your King Trilogy, King of Tokyo, King of New York and of course King Domino. It's these games that I'm writing to you about. As you're no doubt aware, up until recently my hometown of Huddersfield, England has been criminally overlooked as a theme for board games. Now, I'm sure this may have already occurred to you, so I apologise if I'm teaching my grandfather to slap knees, but how about a King of Huddersfield game? I think you'll agree there's a lot of potential here and we may well have the next big hit on our hands. I look forward to hearing from you. Dan Hughes, Noble Order of Huddersfield Board Games. Dear Mr. Hughes, Thank you for reaching out to me. I will see what I can do about working Huddersfield into one of my games. Stephen Bonacore of Stronghold Games is doing a game with me that has a vampire theme. Does Huddersfield have any history with vampires or vampiric legends? As you probably know from my viewer, I am a stickler for accuracy and would not like to choose a setting that doesn't resonate with my topic. I still regret the decision to set Rocketville in Rocketville rather than the city the game was designed for, Seoul. I may be one of the first of your illustrious set of designers that answers your call for a game with Keyforge. As you may know, Keyforge is a unique deck game, meaning each deck is unique and has its own name. I was browsing Selene, stochastic, exotic, list-exploiting name engine, which was a prototype for the name generation that was eventually used. As you can see from the screenshot below, there was a deck, that Fijak Phillips from Huddersfield. I include a bunch of the neighboring deck names so you can see the company Stat Fijak is keeping. I have no reason to believe that they are not printing this deck or a variation, so I am hopeful Huddersfield will have its own Keyforge deck. Peace, Richard Garfield. Great news, lads. We've done it. Huddersfield is finally going to be in a board game. I hate to point it out, but it says Huddersfield. It's missing the S. Bugger. board games where we talk about trends, topics, and things in board gaming and how we feel about them. So the theme for the Blender this week is epic moments in gaming. Gaming moments which are epic. Yeah. And you stand up and you fist bump and you're like, that's not what fist bump is. No, but I mean it works. Fist it works. Bumping. Fist bump. Uh, and you're like, yes! That was the best ever. And so this week I think that we both wanted immediately to, to talk about my favorite game that we just played the other night, and I was reminded of how those moments happen in it, but we also have talked about it a lot. Dead of Winter, yes. or really any semi-cooperative game. I was able to play Battlestar Galactica recently. This thing happened where um, the Cylons, like, like the one of the hidden Cylons, like basically announced themselves and like called in all of the these like Cylons Cylon. to kill us. And oh. this other Cylon who was still oh, hidden was able to essentially change the player turn so that it was somebody it was the admiral's player turn again uh -huh. and they just used the nukes to destroy all of the cylons it was this like amazing moment because we thought we were all gonna die and then when yeah. the funny thing is we found it afterwards that of course it, he undid what his friend had what he just laughing at the cat <laughs> yeah. that formula at sort of the cost of um balance if you will like dead of winter is not balanced you can have no. a really hard objective yeah, versus yeah. an easy one. Oh, for sure. That creates moments of really interesting things. Well, because things seem so impossible. Right. Like, if you have six rounds and you aren't the betrayer and you need three people to die, like, that's that's tough. That's mm -hmm. what makes Dead or Winner work, is yeah. that people who are not the betrayer have objectives yeah. that make them look bad. It's also, I think, what a lot of people don't like about the game. Co-op games in general kind of lend themselves towards this feeling of epicness uh, I mean, just winning ghost stories is an epic moment. Yeah, because you're all working together. Uh, to co and, overcome yeah. what feels like impossible and odds. It, especially when you do have that moment of desperation and then you 
all pull together and get past it, I mean, it really, you've accomplished something big as a group, and that feels good. Versus it feels in, good to share. Yes. Versus, yeah, in a co -op, in a competitive game, yeah. you're not often high-fiving someone who just, no. like, pulled an amazing move and you're dead now, Well, you know? I was thinking about even, like, playing Lisboa or the Gallerist and how you, like, you have these little private victories where you have those, yeah. like, yes, but it's so small, and, yeah. and no one really knows or, all the thought of, like, I mean, it's just, it's so tense, and then when and you finally get to do it, it's just because someone else blocked you, not because there was, like, an, or because someone else didn't block you. There wasn't well, an epic Well, it's thing. really calculated, I think, yeah. is the other thing. So, the other that thing that lends... Trash. Right, exactly. This led us to what we wanted to talk about this week, which is the trend I'm seeing, personally, of a little bit of a blending between some of those more Euro sensibilities and more Ameritrash sensibilities. And the designer that I think exemplifies this is Eric Lang. Blood Rage and Rising Sun um, are good examples where they're very much, they definitely have Euro DNA in there. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of planning and forethought. But there's also, Blood Rage has more randomness, but Rising Sun has that diplomacy factor. Yeah, which I mean has definitely led to some, um, some maybe not epic epic good moments, but epic bad moments um, well, on the table. Well, from your perspective. Yeah, from me. I mean, and I think that... and well, I'm too nice. I'm too nice. The in Rising Sun, there's a formal alliance mechanic, and there's a... What what I observe is that an informal alliance mm -hmm. forms. And so you, you often hate the person that you're in the formal alliance with, which I think works thematically, and it also does a good job yeah, creating... Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It creates stories, mm -hmm. because you're... Well, the whole game is kind of designed to create yeah. a story of, like, how a kingdom rose and fell. And I mean, that, as a, overall, seeing... I mean, I don't think I would ever be like, I don't like epic moments in games. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think that having a story and having those epic moments and playing with friends yeah. is one of the reasons why I like board okay. gaming. I'm excited about this sort of blending, and I think you're seeing more and more of it. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Hey folks, welcome back to my adventures in and around Colorado. I'm Mark Street, and this is Ramblings. Today, we're walking the trails in Fort Collins, Colorado, my hometown. Oh yeah, that's snow. The thing about Fort Collins is that it sits at an elevation of 5,000 feet, and we have all these amazing trails, all these mountainous trails with some historic old landmarks within the trails, old like mills and things of that nature. And this bridge you see behind me was known as the Brooklyn Bridge. And it was used by the Great Western Sugar Factory to haul um, their materials across to the field beyond. So today, we're talking about epic moments in gaming. Probably one of my favorite things about gaming. The thing that's so cool, right, is that epic moments are things that stick with you. You may not remember the exact um, cards that were played or the mechanisms that were used or even the scenario, scenario you were in the middle of, but you might remember that one moment when you flipped that one card and everything changed. Yep, more snow. So, a game that comes to memory, just super recent for me because we played it this week, again was Star Trek Panic from Fireside Games. This game has so much out to destroy you. I mean, all the missions are super difficult and it is truly one of those games that is trying to destroy all the players. And you know what? If there's a Kobayashi Maru game based on the Star Trek storyline and mythos and everything, that Star Trek Panic is the embodiment of the Kobayashi Maru. So in our game this week, we were literally down to one whole section left on the Enterprise. 
Enterprise was on its way out. We thought for sure we were on our way out, but then the tide started to change slowly, but it did change. And, and we broadcast this on our stream. And the cool thing is that everybody was chiming in, oh, you guys are toast. And it was really this fun moment where like, oh, guess what? We're turning the tide. And I do love those moments, right? When you're like, no, there's no hope. It's over and then everything changes. Again, epic moments in gaming. I don't even remember what the mission was and we just played this game, but everything did change and we ended up winning. And it's not even just winning generates those moments. There are some amazing moments we've had like Elder Horror when things just went completely wrong, but it was still an epic moment in gaming. And those are almost equally as fun. It doesn't require a win condition to be epic. And so I've had many of these epic moments and you know what's so awesome about them is that I feel like the cooperative games embody those type of moments way more than the strategic um, competitive games. Of course you have your own personal moments like when you just barely won one of those games, but I feel like the camaraderie and the collective memory of that night from a cooperative game is way more memorable. And I just think it's one of the more enjoyable experiences when something like that happens. Okay, another game, and I can't not talk about this because big nod to Z. Oh boy, it's a random Z. Pandemic Legacy. Absolutely, season one was amazing. And we actually finished season one in December, like a week before Christmas. And I can't even tell you the particulars around it, but I just remember that epic moment where like, hey, we actually finished this in December and won. Another one of my favorite games for epic moments has to be Mansions of Madness, second edition. Oh my gosh, there's been so many amazing story moments that's come out of this game. And the app and how they've integrated everything into the new version just continues to be an awesome experience. Super story driven, that's another thing. Let's talk about story driven. You know, I feel like story driven games also generate more epic moments than your standard, say, Euro or strategic type game. And since it's snowing so hard now, of course, it brings me back to some epic gaming nights with Dead of Winter. Yes, I expect zombies to come around this corner at any moment. But again, that game has so many aspects about it that bring out some really awesome stories on game night. Like just the fact that there's a potential traitor in the midst, and then there's games where there aren't any traders, but you're sure there is one. And those are some really fun game nights. And even if you're not really into that game, the point is story-driven, you know, cooperative games again, really generate those interesting and really amazing gaming moments. Okay, so questions of the week. What do you think are some of your favorite or best epic moments in gaming? And tell me, what do you think, cooperative? more epic or strategic games more epic when you're the solo victor so let me know in the comments below and until next time folks we'll see you at the table in and around colorado as i fall down hey there friends of the blend this is chris and Lindsay from behind the box now who doesn't love a board game that gets everybody out of their seats cheering, clapping, and celebrating something really awesome that just happened on the table. I know we do, and one of our favorite games for it is Sentinels of the Multiverse. Now this is a card game where players work together as superheroes to defeat a supervillain. Each superhero has their own unique deck of cards and powers, and each villain has their own win and loss conditions. And not only have you got them and their minions to deal with, but depending on the location of your battle, you might also be dodging bullets in a Western shootout or outrunning a lava monster. Now, I love this game. This is my favorite game of all time. And a big reason that I love this game is because it offers those epic moments where everyone at some point, every game, gets to feel like a superhero and they have their chance to shine. Yeah, like one time you were playing as um, Legacy 
And Legacy is this really like good guy, um, <laughs> Superman type character. And anyway, the rest of us, we were all just hanging on by a thread. Our life was so low and we still had to defeat this bad guy. Legacy comes in and he sacrifices himself, takes all the damage that we were going to get hit with so that we can make one final push and take down the baddie. It was so cool. At, or there was this time where I was Tachyon. And um, one of the things that Tachyon can do is she can build up these burst cards in her discard pile. And I've been doing this throughout the game with um, the cards that I've been playing. And then at the very end, I was able to take out the bad guy by playing this one card that lets you like add up all of the burst cards and then do one kapow and take them down. <laughs> if I remember correctly as well, that was actually against your nemesis. So it just made it all the more thematic. sweeter and thematic, yeah. <laughs> Now, this stuff happens all the time in this game because it's all driven by cards and there's an unpredictability to card games that we actually really like. I know a lot of people don't like that randomness, but there's only so much you can do. You can try and plan, but there will be something worse that happens that mm -hmm. you couldn't predict. And when that does, it's just so cool to be able to have those moments where somebody, while everyone else is panicking, just goes, I got this, guys. <laughs> I'm going to take care of it. And then they do, and everyone loves it. It makes everyone happy when that happens. Yeah, it's great because it is a cooperative game, so you're all on the same team. So you can share that celebration, mm -hmm. that moment, that little small victory in the wider picture. It's, it's great for that. So Sentinels, for us, easily is one of these games where epic moments seem like just happen all the time, and we love it for that. Do you agree? Let us know down below. I know a lot of people don't necessarily with this game, but we definitely do. If you have a game yourself that you think offers epic moments and great things that you can do, then leave those below as well. We love getting discussions going in these comments. Yeah. And if you want more board game discussions with ourselves, come check us out at our channel or our social media. But until the next one, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. And that's going to do it for us on this episode. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to my contributors, of course. And I hope to see you again on the next Board Game Blender episode. Stay tuned to the Dice Tower for all sorts of gaming goodness. And as I always say, hey, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you next time.